All right. Hello and welcome to the Educare DC virtual open house. Today is segment four of our mini series, Building the Future Through Proper Nutrition. So before we get started, just for housekeeping purposes, I wanted you to be aware that this presentation is being recorded so that those moms and dads who could, that could not attend this session will be able to access the valuable information we will be sharing with you today via our website, www.educaredc.org and our YouTube channel, which is Educare DC. I am Ms. J. Fawn Hood. I am the recruitment specialist for Educare DC programs. I am the face behind all of the invitations and reminders you've been getting in your inbox. I am also a member of the family engagement team and I partner with our enrollment team to ensure that inquiring families like yourself are supported through the eligibility, enrollment, selection process. Um, so that way we can provide a seamless experience. We are so happy to have you with us today, and I'm going to tell you why. The physical benefits of proper nutrition are endless. It gives children energy to live life to the full. It protects against malnourishment. It maintains the healthy immune system. It prevents obesity, and it reduces the risk of chronic disease all great things that we would agree we want for our children. So today we have our Director of Comprehensive Health Services, Ms. Patricia Della Torre, and our Nutrition Consultant, Ms. Sue, here with us to share with you Educare DC's best practices for empowering children and families to make health-focused choices. It is our intention to honor everyone's schedule and stick to the time allotted, but more importantly, we want to provide you with helpful information that you can utilize and you can also take back and share with your network of family and friends. So with that being said, I'm going to kindly ask that you add your questions to the chat box because we're going to make some time for a question and answer segment at the end. This will allow us to honor you with getting all the information that our presenters have prepared out to you so that way you can make informed educational decisions. Lastly, you might want to know that we are actively enrolling. After today's presentation, if you are ready to start the enrollment process, please visit our website. Again, that is www.educaredc.org. We have an enrollment tab at the top of the page, and that will allow you to access our online application. Or if you do still have some remaining questions, you can submit an inquiry that will go to the enroll at educaredc.org email box in which our enrollment team constantly monitors and replies from. We would love for you to join our Educare DC family. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Patricia, who again is our Director of Comprehensive Services. Ms. Patricia, it is all yours. Thank you, Jifon, and thank you for that wonderful introduction of our program. Hello and welcome everyone, and thank you for taking your time to be here with us as we present our segment, Building the Future Through Proper Nutrition. As we all know, a hungry child cannot learn well. So it is our goal to present why is it important to learn early about proper nutrition and healthy eating. In this regard, let me introduce to you to our nutrition consultant, Ms. Sue, who has been with Educare for more than five years now and has a wealth of experience in an early childhood program for more than 25 years. So, if you can, take the mic. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Patricia. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon, and thank you for being here, too. Uh, it's going to be a nice little session that we're going to have. I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the nutrition services that we offer here at Educare DC. Next slide, please. Now, when your child comes to us, the very first thing or the very first thing that we would do would be to have a nutrition assessment. There are two components to the nutrition assessment, and that is the nutrition history and anthropometry. And when we look at both of these, uh, if we see a couple of concerns that come up, we red flag them and those concerns will be addressed. 
The nutrition history is uh, nothing but a little questionnaire. Uh, one of our staff will sit with the parents and you will have to answer a few questions. We have two kinds of nutrition assessment forms, zero to 12 and two to five. Now on the zero to 12 form, uh, this is for infants. We'll ask you questions about uh, your infant's uh, feeding pattern, whether they're breastfeeding, are they on formula? Are they on like a specialized formula? How often do they breastfeed? How often do they have bowel movements? Uh, whether they've started uh, solid foods, all that kind of information, which will make us easier for us to serve your infant. And in the questionnaire, which is for the children between two to five, year, five years, uh, we have questions about uh, what kind of foods they may like, how often do they eat vegetables, what drinks do they drink, what juices do they drink, do they take multivitamins, uh, all those kind of questions. And both of these forms give us an idea about your food habits, a child's dislike, physical activity, all of those questions. Anthropometry. Now, anthropometry refers to the height and weight of a child. Um, we take your, the data that you bring us, you know, when you go to the uh, physician, you have a health record, and then uh, they give you a height and weight that they record at the clinic or the hospital, and you bring that back to us, and we will take that height and weight, and we put it into a program called Child Plus, and what Child Plus will do is it will calculate what is called a body mass index. Now the body mass index is the most reliable indicator of whether a child is underweight, normal, overweight or obesity. This is an indicator that's used all over the world and it's very reliable. It takes a child's height and the weight and it correlates the two and comes up with a number. And using that, we will be able to know whether your child falls into the normal, overweight, obese, or clinically obese category. And what we do with Child Plus is we track your children's anthropometry heights and weights right from the time they come to us until the time they leave. So if they're here between six weeks to five years, that whole period of time, we will be tracking them and we will be offering intervention as required. Now, if we find that your child falls into the overweight or obese category, uh, we will be working with you. We will give you resources to help the child achieve a healthy body weight. At this age, uh, zero to five, diets are not recommended, as in, you know, weight loss diets are not recommended for young children. But it's more like, uh, you know, having some dietary modifications, uh, some physical activity, and the family working together towards eating healthier and helping the child to achieve a healthier, healthier body weight. And follow-up, of course, will be provided. This is just one of the resources that uh, we give to our families. And I just, we just wanted to share this with you. Like this is a kid's activity pyramid. And as you can see from the screen at the bottom of the pyramid, there are all these um, uh, easy activities that a child can do. Like, you know, just dance to music, go running up and down the stairs, uh, help out with chores. And then there's family play, which is good. You know, going out as a family and cycling. Uh, taking a hike, trekking, all those simple, easy things. And then there's group play, which again is very important because group play helps a child to be active along with the group. And here at Educate DC, we provide a lot of opportunity for group play. Uh, we have this huge um, multi-purpose room in the middle of the center, a free blank room with, uh, you know, they have some hula hoops, they have some other little uh, things that children could use to play. And even if they don't use that, there's a lot of room for them to just run up and down and expend all that energy. So on days when um, we have bad weather, you will see our children in there having group play. And right at the top of the pyramid, uh, you can see those activities that we want to limit, uh, screen time, television time, and encourage more of the activities at the bottom of the pyramid. Now, the recommendation is that students should do 60 minutes, an hour or more of physical activity daily. But in reality, uh, many students are not getting an opportunity to be active. Over half the schools, only about 10% of the schools uh, have children who actually walk from home to school. You know, that's an activity which we used to do growing up, and that was exercise too. Um, and only about 
45% to 55% actually have opportunities for the child to be active at school. Again, only about 4% actually have physical education as part of their everyday routine. But at Educare DC, we place a lot of emphasis on physical activity, both in the classroom, out in the playground, and in the multi-purpose room when you know, the weather is bad outside. This is a healthy eating plate, and this is a resource that we would share with our families. Uh, this is what we mirror at Educare DC, uh, healthy oils uh, that you cook with, and then you know lots of vegetables, which give you fiber, fruit, uh, water, eating whole grains, and a nice portion of uh, protein to fill up the rest of your plate. Here you see a little picture representation of a plate, all those nice healthy whole grains on one side, uh, fruit and vegetables on the other, a variety of different kinds of fruits and vegetables, some um, healthy wholesome protein, some dairy, and of course a little bit of the sweet treats that I guess everybody needs. This again is just a picture representation, something that we share with our children and with our families to just kind of show how junk food can fill up your heart or it could be the healthy fruits and vegetables. Here again is another resource that we like to use in our classrooms and which we like to give us to parents as well. Uh, here we used a super figure, like, you know, children love super, uh, what do you call them? Superheroes, right? They love superheroes. So here we have a little superhero. And using the superhero concept, we introduce all these superfoods and tell the child that eating superfoods can make you a superhero in your own little world. And you know, just like talk to them about how, okay, if you drink a lot of milk, you can build nice strong muscles and you can get nice strong bones. And again, if you eat some salmon, you can get good brains eat some baked potato and some tomatoes and you'll have a healthy beating heart. So these are some resources that we share in our classroom and we like our parents to also carry that same concept of a superhero eating superfoods at home. Nutrition history is important. And one of the reasons we gather this data is because uh, we would like to know what's, you know, what the habits of the child are at home. So if we see anything that we could correct, we would like to do that. And uh, two years back, when we did an evaluation of all the nutrition histories that we had collected, we found that 70% of the children under five were actually consuming sugary drinks, like soft drinks. And they were also having sugary juices three to five times a week. Now that is a lot because the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends that you have 100% uh, juice only once a day, about eight ounces, and items like soft drinks and sugary drinks uh, should be limited to maybe once or twice a month for a rare occasion. Uh, so when we found this out, what we did was uh, we created a handout. Uh, next slide, please. We created a personalized handout for our families. Uh, which would give anyone reading it an idea of how much sugar is in all of those drinks that we drink. If you look at the water, there's like zero grams of sugar. And if you look at the can of Coke, there's 35 grams of sugar. Now, one teaspoon of sugar is about four to five grams. So 35 grams of sugar is seven teaspoons. Can you imagine that small bottle of Coke having seven grams of just pure white sugar in it. So those are the kind of details we included on this um, uh, resource guide. And then we gave, uh, we put in a couple of choices for the parents, you know, like uh, they can drink juice, they can have milk instead, they can have water instead. Uh, so we used the information from our nutrition assessment to create resources that would help our families. Now, some other nutrition concerns, uh, whenever we have a nutrition concern, we like to address it. There's the failure to thrive. Failure to thrive is a condition in infants where it usually happens with like low birth weight infants or babies who are born prematurely, and they find it hard to 
catch up weight wise and catch up with everything that a child of that age month should be doing. So with Failure to Thrive, we work closely with the physician and follow their directions. Usually the physician will recommend that they have a nutrient dense diet and they have um, some uh, a pediasure or some sort of supplement. And we provide that at the center. We provide a nutrient dense diet and the uh, supplements that they need. And we work with the families to get the infant back at a nice healthy weight like they should be. Now underweight is again similar to failure to thrive except that it's with older children. And with underweight, uh, again, we provide a nutrient dense diet. A nutrient dense diet is a diet which will help them put on weight without adding junk food. Like we want them to put on weight, but we don't necessarily want them to eat like, you know, sugar and high fat or things which provide empty calories. The emphasis would be more on like nutritious foods like avocados, uh, honey, uh, honey, of course, for older children, but uh, protein foods and foods which would help them gain weight. Anemia is another condition we see pretty often. Uh, this is when a child has low hemoglobin and low hematocrit. And at those times, we work with the families again. Uh, at our sites, what we do is we give them extra portions of protein at mealtime so that it will boost the anemia levels. And then we work with the families so they can do the same thing at home. We also give them vitamin C rich foods because C, with vitamin C helps the absorption of iron. And by adding vitamin C foods, it can make them absorb absorb iron about 50% uh, or 100% more than usual. So we work with them until they get to a normal level or hematocrit, hemoglobin, etc. Now with, we have picky eaters. This is a very common problem, especially if a child has not been in a daycare setting. When they suddenly go into a daycare setting, they don't like to eat. So in those times, you know, uh, we work with the families and the staff. We have some workshops for the staff on how to encourage children to eat. And we work with the families to see if there's anything we can do from our side to make it easier for the child to eat. And in most cases, we find that uh, we can uh, help the child to start eating better uh, after they've been with us for a little while. Constipation may seem like a small problem, but for a child who's been constipated for a period of time, it can be very painful. So here again, we provide high fiber foods and a lot of fluid at the site. And we work with the family too, to make sure they are doing the same thing at home and uh, to help them you know, with natural foods, are not necessarily laxatives unless the doctor recommends, but using natural foods to help relieve constipation. Then diarrhea is another nutrition concern. And of course, when a child has diarrhea, we recommend that they don't come to the center, but we still work with the families at home so they can uh, give the child a lot of hydration so the child doesn't get dehydrated. And also we talk to them about foods that help to bind the stool and help the condition. Another nutrition concern is food allergies and food allergies is something that we take very seriously because some food allergies can be life threatening. And so we make sure and take all the precautions that we need to make sure that a child is not exposed to those foods that they are allergic to and make sure that they have the right substitutions to overcome those allergies. There are the big eight, which are the common ones, uh, eggs, milk, fish, wheat, shellfish, uh, tree nuts, peanuts, soy, and anything apart from the big A2, we take care of it and uh, 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 treat it as a high priority uh, nutrition concern. Some of the diets that come out of food allergies are a gluten-free diet where we don't include any gluten. Uh, we give them rice and oats instead. Uh, Lactose-free, in this, at this time, we would give them a substitute milk. And for the dairy-free, we would make sure that on days when our children have cheese on the menu or lasagna, yogurt, that we give the appropriate substitution. Now, G6PD is a condition which is not very common, but nevertheless, we do have a few children with that. And in this case, usually uh, the child is asked to avoid fava beans. So we provide, make sure that that happens. Plus there are some other uh, things that you could do for a child with G6PD and we include that in a diet package. And any other nutrition concern that comes to us from the physicians, uh, we look after it and take care of it. Now, these are just some of the resources uh, that we've created to help our families. We have this one on anemia, which talks about what anemia is, 
what you should do if your child is anemic. And we talk about foods high in iron. We also talk about tips to help with absorption of iron, vitamin C foods. And then with the G6PD deficiency, there's not a whole lot of nutrition information out there. Usually the doctor will just tell you to avoid fava beans. But there are other things that can be done. Research has shown that our children with G6PD if they can get their vitamins out of whole fruits and vegetables, those are absorbed better rather than getting it from a supplement. So those are things that we would include on this resource guide. Okay, now for nutrition concerns, when a child comes to us with a nutrition concern, we, we bring out what is called a personalized nutrition plan just for that child. And that will go to the food vendor and then it's sent to the food vendor will send the appropriate substitutions and that is given to the child, class teacher and the food allergy or the condition is taken care of. Nutritious meals. Now the CACFP and um, the guidance that we have uh, mandates that every meal should provide at least one third of the RDA for that day, required daily allowance. Now we have put all of our meals into a software system, which allows us to calculate the calories, protein and all the nutrients. And what we've seen is that our meals provide more than one third of the required daily allowance. We have a vendor who's very health conscious and nutritious, nutrition conscious, and uh, he bakes his own bread, he makes his own salad dressing using yogurt, herbs, and oils. He also grinds his own meat. So I would say that 99% of our food is unprocessed. Wholesome meals, uh, we serve fruit, fresh fruit every day with breakfast and with lunch. During the summer, they have kiwis, strawberries, berries, pineapple, peaches, all of those fruits that you have in season. And during the winter, we would have the more, uh, you know, the citrus fruits, the oranges, the pomelos, the uh, melons, the bananas, the apples, but fresh fruit every single day. Once in a while, uh, you may see a fruit cup as a snack on the menu, but otherwise it's just fresh fruit. We have milk with both breakfast and lunch because we want to make sure that our children get their calcium and healthy snacks. And it's overall, it's a very healthy, nourishing, nutritious meal, diets, meals. Our facility is also a nut-free facility. Uh, we don't allow peanuts or nuts of any kind. Even staff are not allowed to bring it into the facility. Vegetarian meals and vegan meals. Now, what happens if you have a child who's a vegetarian or a vegan? You can just send them on to us because we give them healthy, nutritious vegetarian meals, not just vegetables. We give them the protein substitute that they need. Right now, we have a very tasty Boca burger on the menu. And this burger is made with uh, soy, nuts, um, not nuts, sorry, seeds and some healthy protein, uh, um, lentils, and it's a very tasty item. And it has the same protein that you would find in a big piece of chicken. Okay. We also give them um, lentils, chickpeas. Uh, we currently have a chickpeas with mango on the menu, which is very tasty. Even the other children who are not vegan and vegetarian like it. And then when uh, in milk, if the child is a vegan, uh, we give them uh, soy milk in place of milk. So healthy, nutritious, protein-rich, vegetarian and vegan meals. Dietary modifications as required. Um, we take care of all the dietary modifications that are required for special conditions. Uh, two years back, we had a child, a three-year-old child, who because of the, a physical condition could not eat anything that was solid. So whatever we had on the menu, we pureed it and made it in an easy to swallow form for her. Uh, she would have pureed chicken, pureed peas, pureed rice. And we also created some healthy uh, liquid nutrition for her, some shakes. And uh, we helped her to you know, 
all the time that she was with us and any other conditions that the physician um, wants us to have like uh, blenderized meals, uh, liquid nutrition, we take care of that and make the modifications as required. Now uh, over to Patricia. Patricia will be telling you a little bit about uh, nutrition education and what we do with our children and our staff. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for that very elaborate uh, presentation of our nutrition program. So here at Educare DC, we teach our students about proper nutri nutrition in early life. So we dedicate Wednesday as our nutrition day by teaching them how to choose good health choices, let them experience nutrition activities in the classroom, and practice healthy checklists by eating healthy foods, exercise, and hydrating oneself. Next slide. So we also let them experience how to grow vegetables in our garden, starting with planting the seeds, taking care and watering the plants, and watch it grow. So this experience would help them understand not only about nutrition, but science as well. Next slide. Okay, so let me show you the different nutrition activities that we are doing here at Educare. So last July 2019, uh, we have our Nutrition and Health Expo. So what happened is each class used vegetables or herbs from the garden to create a recipe or a product. So these are like just some of the examples that our classroom teachers did. We have zucchini bread, fruit smoothie, veggie pizza, and lavender cheesecake. We also have a vegetable salad and some made poopery and others uh, did santi and the black bean burger. But the one that really outstand and, and the winner of our uh, Nutrition Expo is the Vegetable Chili Cupcakes by Classroom 150. It was a bestseller that uh, parents and staff are just asking for the recipe of this meal. And also, as mentioned, we also have like um, these nutrition crafts uh, made from our garden materials. So they use the seeds that we find in the garden to make some crafts and you know other like um, balls or something like that for, for their uh, activities. We also created our all natural Gatorade with coconut water and herbs from the garden. If you can see um, our, our this um, hydration um, activity is a, a hit for, uh, from our staff and our families. So the following slides will show you different nutrition activities that we are doing here at Educare DC. Like my plate, uh, so we show children healthy choices by letting them choose more, more for vegetables and fruits rather than fatty foods and sugary drinks. So we gave them like a, a paper plate and some cut out pictures and um, let them find um, what are the healthy choices, like which uh, are the vegetables and fruits. And this is very engaging for the children. Another nutrition activities that we did is teaching children about parts of the body using Organ Annie and Organ Andy. In here, we show them our different body organs, how it functions. Like for example, when a child drinks milk, it will go to their stomach and then how that milk will make their bones and teeth strong. Another nutrition activities uh, here it was spearheaded by the teacher in classroom 150 by making vegetable noodles. So she uh, asked the help of the children to help her make this meal and we all know that if the children participate in making a meal, it is very unlikely that they will also eat the food. Another one during our nutrition day is like letting kids make their own parfait using different kinds of food together with yogurt. 
And this one is about gun fishing snack. We use whole grain goldfish. And um, this nutrition activities does not only uh, limit into uh, uh, teaching the kids about nutrition, but also about uh, enhancing their math skills and also like uh, identifying sh different kinds of shapes and colors. This activity that they have is like the fruit kebabs where kids put different kinds of fruits in the skewer and they really like this one. Um, they kind of like eat everything in the, the skewers after making their kebabs. So as we all know, we cannot help others unless we help ourselves. So here at Educare DC, we dedicate a Wellness Wednesday where staff gather and partake healthy meals with one another. This also helps improve our positive engagement with one another. Uh, in this picture, we made cran water and healthy Gatorade for our hydration event. And I think after this, we did have our walk around the park. Another um, activity that we did is like uh, um, a year ago on this date, we uh, celebrate Heart Health Month by doing dark chocolate fondue and berry smoothies, um, which uh, the staff also love. Wellness Wednesday started for this is like the blockbuster of all the the, the activities that we have for staff. So what happened is like uh, every staff will bring a component of the salad and we all gather and prepare and then each of us uh, will partake on this like salad bar and it's really delicious. Last St. Patrick's Day, we did our green smoothies using everything green, like uh, grapes, green grapes, asparagus, kiwi, cucumbers and make it into a smoothie. And now um, I would like to bring back the mic to Ms. Sue. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Patricia. Uh, now uh, we also have nutrition training for staff because we recognize that, you know, we want all our staff to be up to date on everything new that comes up with health and nutrition. And our staff are trained by uh, accredited trainers who are recognized by the District of Columbia. And uh, some of the uh, topics that we include in our training are on family style dining, uh, CACFP meal pattern requirements, infant meal pattern requirements. Uh, every couple of years, these change, you know, the uh, categories that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics changes, uh, like before they used to have babies into three groups, zero to three, uh, three to seven, and seven to 12. And then two years back, they just divided them up into two categories of zero to five and five to 12 and said that babies under zero to 12 should have sol only milk and not have solid foods. So uh, there are things like that which we need to update our staff with. So we include them into the training. Food allergy awareness, civil rights and CACFP, nutrition and physical activity. This is a workshop which helps us to come up with uh, creative ideas for the children and for the staff to keep physically active even during bad weather or cold weather times. Reading food labels, very important. Preventing obesity in a childcare setting and nutrition education for preschoolers. We keep adding to this list of training, but we make sure that all of our staff are trained and up to date with everything health and nutrition. Nutrition workshops for families. Uh, this is something that we provide for families and um, uh, we have live food demonstrations. And apart from that, we have workshops uh, like healthy snacking for toddlers, uh, reading food labels, again, very important because all of our parents should be informed on what's in what they buy and have some tips on how to quickly read the food label and decide what's good for them. Thrifty shopping, getting the most bang for your buck knowing how to go into a grocery store and make use of all those sales and make use of buying in bulk and saving a couple of dollars here and there. Uh, infant feeding, very important. Transitioning to solid foods. Kids in the kitchen, where we encourage children 
to play and to work with their parents in the kitchen and uh, with the idea that a child will always eat what they make. Natural remedies for constipation, a workshop we give for families too, hydration. And if parents come up with other topics that they would like to be trained on, uh, we create workshops and have workshops for families. Uh, another resource for families is Produce Bag Thursdays. Uh, we, we partnered with this uh, group called Market Share. And every Thursday, they bring us a big bag of fresh produce. There's a lot of produce in there. It's like uh, probably about $40 or $50 worth of produce in there, which is enough to feed a family of four or three for a week. And uh, they only charge $7 for this bag. So every Thursday, you'll see these grocery bags lined up inside Educare, and our parents will pay $7 for what is worth uh, $50 and take it home to make good uh, fresh fruit and vegetable preparations. Any resource that is helpful, uh, we make flyers and pass it out to the community and to our families. So currently we have a program where all of our children who are not coming to the site receive virtual meals. So once a week they come in and they get their meals for the week and they just have to take it home. And apart from that, we found another uh, food resource uh, recently where uh, they gave us free hot meals every day. And this is happening in just the school next to Educare DC. So we sent the information out to our family so they can take part in it. So any parent who goes there gets hot meals, not only for their chi one child, but for any children they may have under age 18. So this is just to show you some examples of how any resources that we find we share with our families. Another nutrition resource for families and staff is the food safety manager certification. Especially now with COVID, a lot of people are losing jobs, which is very sad. So uh, we have started this where, actually we started this a few years back, where we train our staff and families, parents, anyone who wants to get certified as a food safety manager to increase job scope and employment opportunities. Now, if you go out, this kind of a certification would cost about $200, but here at Educate DC, we sponsor the training and we provide it free to our parents. Family style dining is a very pleasant sort of a dining uh, atmosphere, which we practice at our sites, or at least used to practice in us at our sites uh, pre-COVID. Uh, here, all of the children will sit around the table with the teachers. They pass platters around. Uh, they pass the food around, have pleasant conversation, and this increases their table etiquette, helps them to develop more social skills, and they also learn about the food that they eat. But now, with COVID, uh, we have been following the CDC guidelines, which include physical distancing, and we have a modified family style dining. And I just want to share a few slides of what that will entail if your child comes to us. We have a training for the staff, which is called meal service during a pandemic. And during this time, what would happen is uh, we explain why there is this um, urge to have extra precautions during mealtime because there is an increased exposure to juices, mouth fluids, when a person chews, swallows, or eats food. Now children maybe, you know, they run around, they play, they're supposed to wear masks, but even if they don't wear masks, you know, it's hard to have a child to wear the mask all the time, they're playing. But when they're eating together, they're opening their mouth and there's more chance of fluids. So because of that, we take extra precautions. And here you can see, a picture of how we practice our modified family style dining. This is actually a picture of our classroom, the way it's set up now. You can see there, there are two children sitting at a table where normally we would have had about six children. So instead we just have them sitting with physical distancing. They're still talking to each other, but from across the table. And we have what is called a staggered meal time. Some children will be at the table eating and the rest of the children will be in another little area 
having a food related activity. And then when they finish, they come to the table and the children from the table will wash their hands and go to that activity. So this helps us to maintain the physical distancing and also give them a good experience during lunchtime. One staff will keep the children occupied while the other staff guides the children at the table. Pre-plating is what we are into now because uh, we don't have passing of food platters anymore. We don't have passing of pictures anymore, no sharing foods, and the food is pre-plated for the child before the child gets the meal. So the teacher will take the tray and they will put a nice portion of meat, bread, vegetable, fruit, and place it before the child. But if the child wants extra, they can always raise their hand and then the teacher will take it to them. Sanitizing practices, we have increased this after COVID. We always had good sanitizing practices where the staff would wipe down the table before and after a meal. But now we upped it even more. And um, we have uh, in between two, like if you have two sets of children coming to the table, before the next set comes in, the tables and the chairs are all wiped down. We use only disposable plates and glasses so the child can dispose of their own uh, meal after they finish and uh, we wear they wear gloves masks and uh, we try to keep the place as safe as possible uh, hand washing and gloves are changed before pre-plating in between groups of children after and as often as needed tooth brushing is a very good habit but currently we do not encourage uh, we are not encouraged to practice it at the site because again uh, because you know of the mouth being open and exposure to fluids, etc. So we encourage parents to brush their children's teeth at home. Uh, we can give them toothbrushes, toothpaste, anything they might need. So we encourage all the toothbrushing to be done at home. Masks are very important at this time. And we make sure that all of our teaching staff wear masks all the time. And even during mealtime, our staff wear masks they help the children, but they're also wearing their masks. Children remove their masks during the mealtime and place it next to them or in a sterile area. And after the meal, they put their masks back on. But mask wearing is very, very important for us at this time to ensure the safety of our children. Um, so we've given you a bird's eye view of everything that happens uh, with regards to nutrition at the site. And now we could take some questions and Ms. Jay will be um, uh, handling the question part. Right, Jay? Yes, yes. What a wonderful presentation that was. I mean, I was fed today. So thank you so much, Ms. Sue and Ms. Patricia for sharing a wealth of information. I do have a few questions um, for you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and put them out there and uh, you guys can popcorn amongst yourself on who you would like to respond. So the first one is, um, I don't want my son to receive cow's milk. Do you have other options to offer? Can I take this too? Can yeah. I answer? Okay, yes. So yes, uh, we do offer uh, soy milk and lactate milk for children who are like lactate, uh, lactose intolerant. So all you need to do is sign a form and have a medical substitution form signed by your doctor so we can give your child the milk of your choice. I hope that answers your question. We got a thumbs up. Okay, great. Next question. My three-year-old child does not like vegetables. What will you do to help her? Uh, can I take that question? Sure. Okay. Go for okay, it. So um, uh, here's what we do. Here at Educare DC, we provide vegetables with their lunch every single day. They may have two vegetables. And when your child comes to us, and sit around with children at a table and they see other children eating vegetables, it's going to make them want to eat vegetables. So that's probably the best way to introduce vegetables to a child. Peer pressure. Put them in a group with other children who are eating their vegetables. And the vegetables that we serve to our children here at Educare DC are very tasty. If it's not good, we take it off the menu and we reinvent the recipe to make it into something that the children love. So send your children to us and I think we can guarantee that after a week or two, they'll be eating vegetables and asking for them at home too. 
That's great. We know that vegetables are so important. They're superfoods. Remember that superhero? So we're, we're going to support you in making sure that they get the, the vittles that they need. We have another one. It's kind of related to the question we had before, but maybe it can expand. My son is allergic to dairy and could have severe reactions if exposed. What steps would you, would you take to have him stay safe? Um, can I answer that question? Okay. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. We understand how you know, food allergies are so important. So first of all, we make sure there's no cross-contamination. We have pitchers that are for milk and for soy milk. And we do not use the same pitcher for both the milks because we do not want any milk proteins to get mixed up with the soy protein by mistake. And then again, it depends on the severity of the milk allergy. Some children are so allergic to milk that even the smell of it, or even if they touch it, they could break out into a reaction. So for those kind of children, we would have them sitting at a separate little table, segregated, only during mealtime. Other times, you know, they're going to socialize with the other children, but we want to make sure that they don't even touch the milk. Now, for children who are not as severely affected by milk protein, we would have them sit at the table, but make sure that they have the right substitution. We have a list of children with a milk allergy in the classroom and in the kitchen, and we would keep checking on them to make sure that they only eat what's given to them and that they are not exposed to milk or milk protein in any way. I hope that answers your question. We got a thumbs up, very good. Okay, next question. My child is five months old. What is your plan to transition her to solid foods? So can you ask her that's your expertise? Pardon? Okay, sure. Answer, uh, yeah. I'm happy to. Okay, now uh, we follow the guidelines set out by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And about three years or two years back, uh, they said, they recommended that you start solid foods when a child turns five. Okay, because they said that under five months, the child should only be drinking formula or breast milk because they need the nutrition from milk, formula and breast milk. So we start transitioning a food to solid foods, uh, transitioning a child to solid foods only at five months old. So if you've started earlier, that's fine. You know, that's something that you are doing at home, but that's not a practice that we would follow because we have to follow the guidelines. But when we do start transitioning them to solid foods, we will always check with the parent and we coordinate with the parent. We ask the parent, have you started carrots at home? Because we'd like to start it. Have you started beans at home? Because we'd like to start it. And we follow through and we work with the family so that the child is not forced to have something that they've not tried out at home. The home is probably the best place to try out a new food, unless the parent tells us and says, you know, can you start the child on like meat this week? Because I'm planning to do that. So we work together with the parents while following the recommended guidelines. Thank you, Ms. Sue. Um, I have another question. Do I have to pay for my meals or is it part of the program? Patricia will answer that. Yes, so our meals um, that consist of breakfast, lunch, snacks, and sometimes supper when we used to have it are all free. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. Very and I just good. want to add that they're very healthy, nourishing. Uh, they're really good meals. When we choose a food vendor, we go through a lot of uh, people and make sure that we only get the best food vendor for our children. Wonderful. Last question. My child is used to eating certain kinds of foods. Can I bring food from home? Um, I could answer that. Now, we have a policy here at Educate DC where we do not allow outside food from home, generally speaking. And uh, some of the reasons why we do this is because, first of all, there's this whole aspect of food safety and sanitation. Now, if something goes wrong, you know, with the food that our children need, we can always go to the vendor and say, hey, something you served our children was not right, they fell sick. But if we have food coming from outside, we lose that control. We won't know what caused the 
uh, reaction or, or the sickness, etc. And another reason is uh, we would like our children to be eating the same food. Because think about it, if you are like having some special food for your child, say you have like all of the children are eating mac and cheese and your child is eating a nice little piece of steak and potatoes, everyone's going to want that. All the children are going to be like, hey, why can't we have that? And uh, vice versa, you know, if your child is having mac and cheese and on that day we have nice salmon on the menu, your child is going to want that. So as far as possible, except for food allergies, we try to keep it uniform. So that's another reason why we do not encourage outside food. But we like to work with the families. So suppose your child is used to eating something. Uh, we've trained our staff to encourage children to eat what's on their plate. So we will give a child time, you know, it takes time for everything, any new habit. But if that's not happening and the child is still not eating, we work together with the families to see if we can provide some of those foods that the child is used to eating at home. And, you know, your child comes first and we want to make sure that your child eats. So we would make some exceptions and try to provide it ourselves and uh, work with the situation individually as we come across it. Wonderful. Well, that concludes all the questions that we had in our Q&A segment. So thanks again, Ms. Sue and Ms. Patricia for providing that information. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I think I said it in the morning session, but when you say steak and potatoes, I get so hungry. So that was amazing. I walked away with a few tips and tricks that I believe I'm going to try to incorporate into my meal planning. I hope that you found the information that was shared today very helpful and that you also leave today feeling more informed about our best practices to encourage healthy movement, healthy eating, how we sanitize to ensure that your family is safe and healthy because that's what's most important to us. So before we leave today, I wanted to plant a few seeds. If you can just give me a few more moments of your time. Um, and they're really about some upcoming events that we have that I would love for you to be able to attend. So like I said before, this is a five part mini series. Um, if you've been coming along with the journey, you are now in segment four. Um, if you are just joining us, welcome. We we have one more segment to go for you. Um, and that's going to be next Tuesday, March the 2nd, the power of inclusion and mental health, in which our inclusion and mental health team are going to share Educare DC best practices in creating a learning inclusive environment. So I think that this is going to be a great topic of discussion. I don't want you to miss out. You can go ahead and reserve your seat for free via our Eventbrite page. So you're going to search Educare DC um, on eventbrite.com and you will find our lineup. The last event we have is a bonus event. It is where our ladies of enrollment will be coming right back at you on a Saturday, March 13th, to provide one-on-one -on -one enrollment support. So they're going to dedicate a Saturday to provide 15-minute one-on-one uh, segments for parents like yourself who may need um, support in going through our enrollment process. We we want to make it as easy, as supportive, and as stress-free as possible. So they will be assisting you with how to complete your application, um, making sure that you have your proper documentation, and if you are needing of support of locating some documents or retrieving it from an agency, we will provide that support as well and guidance. Um, in addition to scheduling your intake interview, all the things that you know we can do to help support you in getting your child enrolled and ready to go for our upcoming school year. I also just want to remind you, we have our 80 early head start, zero to three seats coming available this May with our new location, Educare DC IDEA. We also have 24 seats available for our expectant moms of the district um, through our unique prenatal program. And then we are revving up simultaneously for open enrollment for our fall school year, school year 21-22 uh, for Educare DC Parkside, in which we have 72 additional early Head Start seats, zero to three. And then we have 80 pre-K seats, which are our pre-K three and pre-K four. We are getting our babies ready for kindergarten transition. We have STEAM. Uh, we have all kinds of great activities and academic um, experiences to make sure that they are prepped and ready to go as they transition into kindergarten. 
So the next event is going to be our town hall session, which is an get to know Educare DC info session. It is going to be held on Thursday, March the 11th. Um, and it's going to answer all of those questions evolving and revolving around our new location coming in May, um, Educare DC idea. So as far as the exact start date, you hear me saying May a lot, but by um, March the 11th, we're gonna be providing you with our opening date. Also, what is gonna be the educational format that we will be using? Currently at our Parkside location, we have a hybrid. So we have some students that are on site, others are experiencing a virtual learning remote. Um, and we're gonna be discussing what's going to be the learning format for Educare DC IDEA. Uh, so there's going to be a plethora of answers that we'll be able to provide and information about our new location if you are interested in applying. So please do me a favor, send an email to enroll at educaredc.org. Again, that's enroll at educaredc.org. Put in the subject line, Educare DC idea. And in the body of the text, just simply say, I want to attend the town hall. And you will immediately receive your Zoom, your Zoom link um, and Zoom invitation to attend this town hall session. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, if you can come on out to the uh, power of inclusion and mental health. If not, we look forward to seeing you at the town hall session. We just look forward to seeing you. And we really, really are excited about you joining the Educare DC family. So with that being said, I want you to have a positively powerful day. And again, we thank you for your time and coming and learning more about Educare DC. Bye-bye.